unsurprisingly got 31 poems in, but I thought I'd start with the opening uh, poem in the book, partly to give you a sense of where I am in the world. Uh, I'm joining you from the from the black country in the English Midlands, and that's the area to the north and west of Birmingham, which was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, for better or worse. And um, it's uh, this poem, this initial poem, it's always been a very industrial area. This initial poem is set in 1832 when the region was famously described as being black by day and red by night. Black by day because of the smoke and the dirt from all the industry and red by night because of all the furnaces. Um, this poem takes as its premise, there's a true story that the young Princess Victoria, who later became Queen Victoria, traveled through the region by train on her way somewhere and was so appalled by what she was seeing through the window that she got the uh, servants to draw the curtains so that she wouldn't have to look at it. So this is a poem called Train Spotting, 1832. So here's us grafting away Mines, factories, furnaces, every which way you look. Men, women, kids, our work turning the sky red by night, black as coal by day. Making boats, rails, bridges, chains, nails, keys, all of it with our sweat, our hands, our toil. Dying in accidents and explosions, buried in pitfalls and mass graves, someone new in our place by morning. And some of us stoke our anger. Others say it's just the way it is. Either way, it's us grafting, putting bread on the table, living hand to hungry mouth. Been this way since Adam was a boy. Then Victoria comes through by train, future queen of empire, she who'll have us paint the world red in her honour. I admit, I was curious. What will we make of her? What will she make of us? Will anything come of it? Will the royal eye survey our kingdom and feel pride? Her Majesty's carriages never slowed, curtains drawn tight over windows so as not to see us, the glow of hell at her country's heart, her grave diggers, her mine workings, her people, and rage burned through me. I screamed at train and curtains as they rolled into the distance. Sorry, Your Highness, for even existing. Then I spat on my hands and I set back to work, trying to put food on the table. And it's us, grafting away mines, factories, furnaces, every which way you look. Men, women, kids, our work, turning the sky red by night, black as coal by day. So, so that's, um, that's the history of where I live. Um, and it remained a very, very heavily industrialised area right through probably till uh, maybe the mid 1980s when a lot of that collapsed. All the, the steelworks and the drop forges and all the associated industries disappeared and took with it the, the kind of mass employment and secure employment that they'd previously been. Um, and so now a lot of it's more casual work perhaps less well-paid, uh, less skilled. But it's still, a, it's still a, a fascinating place to live, although it, it will never end up on the kind of tourist hotspot lists of 10 places you must visit before you die. But it's still really vibrant and interesting and colourful. So this is a poem about living here now. Um, for those of you who don't know, public transport here, we a lot of buses, and the buses are double decker buses. So there's two floors. You can travel downstairs or you can climb the stairs and travel upstairs. And always, without exception, the best place to travel is upstairs at the front. This 
is a poem called Top Deck. Um, one phrase, um, car say fairer, is a bit of dialect. It's short for can't say fairer than that, which is kind of like, yeah, I'm okay with it. Oh, and a special is generally a can of strong lager, uh, drunk by people who perhaps are a little more dependent on alcohol than they might like to admit. From way up here, you can see it all. The terrible beauty of pensioners staring through windows, school kids slouching towards classrooms, not wanting to go. You see flashing lights at the level crossing, diesel running back to base light loco, arctics moving stuff from there to here, inching in the nose to tail to nose. You see the dumpy ballet of forklifts loading and unloading, men in the new flat cap of the company high vis, grousing and grafting and joking. You see backyard mechanics in corrugated yards, smeared in oil and grease, the nodded car fairer, the sheen of puddles and of handshakes. You see the lads on bikes who've nothing on their, to their names, yet pull perfect effortless wheelies the length of their street, day after day after day. You see Johnny striding down the towpath, kind of special on the go, two more in his coat pocket just to take the edge off, you know. And in between the high rise, where the sun glints through, you can sometimes see hope if you squint real hard and let your gaze slip out of focus. So, um, and I think one more set here. Um, we have Mother's Day in the UK. I think that's a pretty international kind of celebration. Um, this is a poem about being in one of the local pubs on, on Mother's Day. Um, a pub that would be, it's part of a, be a chain pub, a budget pub with cheaper booze and cheap meals. Um, I think the only term that I might need to explain for people from outside the UK, travellers. Travellers are, they're not gypsies, they're not Romany, but they're the same nomadic, itinerant kind of lifestyle that used to be in horse-drawn caravans. Um, and would have traveled around the country moving perhaps with agricultural work from harvest to harvest uh, or selling clothes pegs or recycling scrap metal or whatever. Um, probably one of the most ingrained and possibly still acceptable discriminations in this country is against travelers. Uh, people will be dismissive of them in a way that they would really hesitate to do about any other minority. So this is called Mother's Day. Let us sing a song of the tiny tattered town, of the pub at its locked down, knocked down heart and of those who drink there. Let us sing of Mother's Day and celebration of the family night out, of a large glass of red and the make that a double, of burgers with all the trimmings, a side of onion rings and chips with everything. Sing of curry and a pint and change from a tenner. Let us sing of the bevy of traveller women, loud and drinking and drunk and there. Don't give a toss if you serve food. We're bringing the pizzas in anyway. Don't even think of stopping us. Nonchalance. Sing of their children who climb barefoot over the tables, over and under and through, caring nothing for rules. Let us sing of the bar staff, budget uniformed, overworked and underpaid, who are suddenly busy at the other end of the bar, who have a finely tuned instinct for looking the other way, who know there's not a chance in the world the money covers this. No chance at all. Let us sing of it being someone else's problem. Quite definitely someone else's problem. Let us sing then of the young manager, his stooped shoulders, his muttering, his 
sighs as he wanders over for the third time, counting the minutes, praying to get to the end of the shift without it kicking off. Sing of the token gesture of negotiation. Sing of putting to one side the memory of what happened last time. Sing of his hope he doesn't have to draw the line. Let us sing of everyone in there knowing the cops will be late, useless. Sing of keeping one eye on the exit, of knowing that if it all goes down, well, <laughs> devil take the hindmost. Let us sing of take a deep breath and bear it, of it not being your business, none of it, of swallowing this down, letting it slide. Let us sing of hours measured pint by pint, of old men slipping home, of the crackling tension of trouble ebbing like a tide you hadn't noticed turn. Let us sing of lost nights, last buses, of just one more before you go, of pizza crusts trodden in carpets, of traveller women beyond drunk now, queens of all they can keep in focus. Let us sing, my friends, sing a song of the tiny tattered town, of the pub at its locked down, knocked down heart and of those who drink there. Let us sing of Mother's Day and celebration of the family night out of empty grass glasses and a last one for the road. Let us raise our cracked and tuneless voices. Let us sing. Cheers. Ooh, right. Oh, so. beautiful. I mean, let's hope by the time Mother's Day arrives, which is, I believe, is that the first Sunday or the second Sunday in March in the UK? Something it, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hope nothing will be locked down and knocked down. And uh, let's hope everybody will be safe. <laughs> yeah. I really liked how you said, um, measure uh, the the hours measured pint by pint. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. The connection oh, between you. time and what you do with it and the means of celebration is just beautiful. There's a very ritualistic connection here between the symbol and the time and, and all that. There's just another dimension to your poetry, you know, beyond the normal, beyond the um, what we see. So there's something inside the surface, always. It's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad that came yeah. across. Um, and I wanted I wanted very much for those opening poems as well to give a sense of life here um, mm -hmm. and what it's like and, and the celebration and the strength and the resilience as, as well as the perhaps the less affluent and and less attractive sides of it. Um, but it is a great place. I, you know, mm -hmm. I love it. Um, so yeah, uh, carrying on this, um, today, you may, as you may know, is, uh, well, it's the 11th of November, obviously you know that. So here in the, the UK, it's, um, Armistice Day, where we commemorate the fact that on the 11th of November at 11 o'clock in the morning on, in 1918, the guns fell silent in the First World War and, and sort of armistice was declared. Um, I've always been fascinated by what we are taught about our history and what we are not taught about our history. Um, and this next poem is, is a reflection on that, really. Um, it came about several years ago. I went to do a poetry reading down in central London near Liverpool Street Station. And often one of the great things about a poetry reading it's the, it's the open mic poets who you might never see anywhere else, who may only have one or two poems, but sometimes they can be the best thing that you hear that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, this lad got up and he read a poem about a woman called Kate Sharpley, who I had never heard of. And in the interval, I went and asked him about her and blah, blah, blah. And he told me, and then I went off and did what research I could. And, um, and this is, a poem about Kate. Um, 
you need to know that it's set in 1917 uh, in London. And one of the things when I was researching, I found which really amazed me was that in the First World War, if the wind was blowing the right way and it was quiet, in London, you could hear the artillery at the front in France, which astounded me. So, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a true story. It's called Kate's War. For three years now, the war they said would end by Christmas has made the paper one unending list of names spat out the maimed, the blind, the broken. At dawn, as barges slip along the Thames, you can hear the murderous rumble of the guns, turning fields to mud, turning men to mud, turning fathers, brothers, sons to cratered mud. Today, with all due ceremony and pomp, accompanied by moneyed men who stride the world, Queen Mary, visits the East End to drop fresh minted medals in the hands of grieving factory girls, to offer for their loss cold polished metal for beating hearts, pressed shining tin for flesh that lived and pulsed. Your role, Kate, is to pawn back the dress you keep for best, wait in line, curtsy, say, thank you, ma'am, Accept what is offered on behalf of what is dust. Dab, if you must, at your eyes with a handkerchief, but be stoic, loyal, proud. But you, just 22, your father dead in the mud, your brother dead on the wire, your boyfriend dead, missing, shot for mutiny, you never knew. You ball up your rage and your pain and your grief, hurl this consolation back. Shout out loud, keep them yourself, if they mean that much. At the front, a man escaping with a scratch from the shell which takes the head clean off his pal might give thanks. Would not believe his luck at a trickle of blood down the cheek when death takes battalions. No such miracle here. While flunkies flutter round the royal wound, coppers haul you to the cells, beat and batter you, grown men on last because you must learn there are limits to men's tolerance. You must learn a girl must know her place. Released days later without charge, friends do not recognise your bruised and blooded face. Your job at the factory, gone. Your father is dead in the mud. Your brother is dead on the wire. Your boyfriend is dead, missing, shot for mutiny. You never know. But you cared nothing for their baubles dipped in poor men's blood. And you told them so. Cheers. Um, the, what I found interesting as well with that is the the way that Kate's story, although it's never officially acknowledged, I mean, I, I consider myself quite well read and I'd never heard of this woman, um, is kept alive or had been kept alive. Um, she came out after that incident, she lost her job, she was fired, she was handing out anti-war leaflets on the street and the police told her that if they saw her again, they'd arrest her for soliciting and prostitution. Um, so she had to move away from where she lived. And I only know about it because of the chance of being at a poetry reading where this lad also read a poem about it. And he only knew about it because it turned out in the 1970s uh, at a demonstration against the National Front who were right wing fascists. Um, an old lady turned up at a demonstration and someone went to go you need to watch out because you need to get away because it could turn nasty and that was Kate Sharpley at that point who was in her 80s and still standing up for what she believed in which I just thought was a fascinating story and I'd love to know more about it. So um, 
a bit of a change of poem now. Um, this one's very much UK centred, so bear with me on this. You may be aware that um, we're having an interesting political time here at the moment. We've got Brexit coming our way, um, which, uh, well, we'll see how that all works out. So this is a poem I, I wrote about, not so much about Brexit directly, but about the um, political intrigue and manoeuvring and betrayals that went on around it. There are a few uh, names referred to here. They are all politicians. Gove, Cameron, Bojo is a kind of nickname for uh, Johnson, who's our current prime minister, actually. And, uh, and Rupert Murdoch, who uh, is a newspaper baron and the man behind Fox News in the States. So um, I wanted to write about it. It was nonsense politics. I couldn't find a way of doing it. And then I decided a nonsense poem was probably the only way to go. So if you're familiar with the work of Lewis Carroll and Jabberwocky, uh, you may recognize where I've gone with this. So this is um, a poem called Stabber Jockey. Twas Brexit. And the slithy gove did frot a crutch in dwarfish glee. He snicker snacked the camarove, Machiavellia dastardly. Beware the stabber jock, my son, the empty eyes, the robo glint, who fellow breaks the murdo crone, the rupert turtle uber gimp. He palarized the bojo cloon, they chummed upon their sunderbus, emblazoned it with fibaroons and bamble, untruth oozled us. The tousled toddler slaughter chop. His desty plans an eaten mess, the slubber gubby golem gove, a shadow hand of viciousness. Oh, gipper chund and vomba blast, the skitter chitter slick and sly, the snicker snack of backstab blades, the scrabbleage to ruthler eyes, the bubba chut of carries mist, the turtle truck of banal bore, his patter frondled on the head, a pawn upon a checkerboard. Beware the stabber jock, my son the empty eyes, the robo glint, who fellow breaks the murdo crone, the rupert turtle, uber gimp. There you go. Um, hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> I used to have to start a set with that because um, there's a lot of made up words, as you may have gathered, and it can be, uh, it was a tricky one to learn. Right. Um, you may possibly be aware there's been an election in the US um you may also be aware that that one person has won another one has apparently lost um i'm not passing any judgment on that but this is a celebratory poem that was written quite a while ago not so much about who wins and loses an election as you'll probably see um you probably gather Again, for those of you outside the UK, uh, Theresa May was a prime minister uh, before Boris Johnson. She gets a mention. So this is a poem, a celebration called On That Day. On that day, when we can barely hear ourselves think for the pealing of church bells, the cheering of crowds, when all the pubs are full, and the street parties last till every bottle's empty and the sun is crawling over the rooftops for the third time. When we wake on strangers' sofas, on buses and in parks, face down on tables and kitchens and houses and towns at the other end of the country with no idea how we got there. Praying to God for Alka-Seltzer, muttering how we'll never drink again, then we will know. We were there, wherever it was, whoever we were with, whatever it was we did or didn't do on that day, that blessed day when Donald Trump learned to love himself. Not the late at night behind closed doors self-loving in front of the laptop, not the live streamed from a Moscow hotel room self-loving where the girls do that thing he loves, 
make the right encouraging noises and never draw attention to his tiny desperate hands. No, not that. Cast that image from your mind. Seriously. Cast it further. On that day, that happy day, the stars and the planets find some new alignment. Butterflies flutter in joyful formation over the last remaining patch of rainforest and the gods of all the major religions pause in their eternal game of paintball, shrug their shoulders, decide to toss us a bone. And so it is on that glorious day Trapped in the bathroom with his morning stink, Donald stands before the mirror as he washes his hands and sees, for the first time in his life, not the coward who dodged the draft, not the braggart who has no friends, not the mediocre businessman propped up by daddy's money, not the misogynist who hasn't got the balls to make amends. Not the climate change denier, not the birther, not the racist, not the hapless, hopeless liar who tweets bullshit with no basis, not Putin's little puppet, not the purveyor of fake news, not this most inadequate of presidents, unable to fill others' shoes. Instead, instead, he sees the lost child he once was, the dreams he once harboured, a readiness to see the best in others, a happiness and innocence and hope. And Donald drops to his knees by the toilet bowl and sobs amid the splash stains and the soap, pulls out his phone and types, I am so, so sorry. Send. And all across the planet, the party starts. Seven billion people giving it large on the terrestrial dance floor. Pensioners necking more booze than you could ever shake their stick at. Gangsters loved up on pills and purple hearts. On day two, things got so messy. We even let Theresa May join in. And as the pair of us sat round a campfire, drinking tequila slammer after tequila slammer after tequila slammer after tequila slammer, with the stars twinkling overhead, she took another crafty toke and said, Comrade, let us be clear about what this does and doesn't mean. I leaned in to hear her over the din of marching bands. Let's not forget it's one very small step, but it's still bigger than his tiny hands. There you go. Right. Um, Humour, I always feel, is an important part of poetry. So, um, misogyny got a mention in that poem. Um, this poem, yeah, kind of looks at that. If you've been to London, you'll be aware that one of the forms of public transportation is the tube, the underground railway, the network of lines. And that if you're standing on the platform at the tube waiting for a train, the curved wall of the, of the tunnel opposite will have huge advertisements on it. A few years ago, there was an advert, black and white, really contrasting, highly defined. A woman from probably chin to mid thigh, black and white, amazing shape, sweat on her skin, bright yellow bikini. And in big, bright yellow words next to it, are you beach ready? With the not very subtle implication being, no, you're not. The only way you've got a chance is if you buy our product. Now, I don't see how making anybody feel uncomfortable in their own skin helps anyone at all. So I wrote this. This is a poem uh, from my book, A Fine, Fine Place. It's called Why You Are Beach Ready. Because you deserve to feel the sun on your skin, the sand between your toes, to slough off the workday drudge and free your smile. Because it will be fun. Because ice cream melts fast 
and taste good because it's your laugh that matters because no one ever died thinking the best thing they did was spend three years on a diet so they could wear a bikini for half an hour on the one decent day we have in a British summer then spend that 30 minutes holding their stomach in afraid to breathe really do the maths because you're beautiful right now because when did you last build a sand castle because you will return home sun-kissed and contented because as soon as a cheap hustler in a bad suit tries to sell you something you don't need it because there are small fish scurrying crabs and anemones in the rock pools and they don't give a toss about your curves your weight your bmi because i am a lot like an anemone and most men are because at night you can go skinny dipping and it will feel like liberation because it's not the office because life is too short to be miserable because you can gaze out to where the sea meets the sky off into that infinite blue and out there light years away on a planet we haven't even found yet a creature is dipping all 17 of its three foot toes in the water and gazing right back at you because never let anyone tell you what you can and cannot do never let anyone tell you what you can and cannot do just never ever ever let anyone tell you what you can and cannot do because your dreams are worth more than gold and you are your dreams and more because the best moments in life can be stitched together with seaweed, shells, the sound of surf, the memory of laughter, sunlight, shimmering on water. Because I may not know much, but I'm sure of this. Because you're beautiful right now and you're ready and you want to. Go. So, right. Ooh, another poem. This next poem also at the coast, really. Um, I don't know if, if you write poems yourself. I don't know how it is for you, but I know that whenever I've written a new poem, um, it automatically becomes the most exciting thing I've ever written. And uh, I can't wait to share it with other people. So um, this is a, a first outing for this poem um because part of it as well for me is learning how it sounds in the air um which is an important thing for performance poetry um this poem came about last year maybe um went down to do a poetry gig in swansea with uh, emma Persehouse, who's the poet laureate of wolverhampton and we went down we had a couple of days in swansea uh, which is uh, a port on the South Welsh coast. And wandering around the, the city, there were posters stuck up on shop fronts and lampposts and wherever uh, of a young lad who'd gone missing, about 18 years old. Um, a refugee, he and his mum had come and made a new home in South Wales. Uh, and he'd gone missing. So this is for him. It's called 15 Minutes. That's the working title for him. He tells his mom he's going to be famous. That one day everyone will know his name. One day he'll be in every paper, be all over the TV. Not for nothing bad, Mama. And when she raises her hands to heaven and says she'll be happy inshallah if he studies hard at college if he gets straight a's he grins embarrassed and shy shrugs his shoulders and tells her i just love music mom i just love music that afternoon on the bus into town the pothole streets are the percussive beat to his life the light a vocal line he must get down. He taps his fingers to the syncopation screech of herring gulls in flight. That night, he dances. Today, 
he sellotaped to every lamppost. Missing, have you seen? His Cheshire cat smile, an enigma, a mystery. No one knows if the river or the sea sang him a tune so beautiful. He leaned in close to listen, to breathe in its rhythm, its melody, and when the water opens up in invitation, maybe he slips in, swirling and spinning, tapping his feet to its breathtaking, block-rocking, heart-stopping beats, finding fame, tastes of salt, telling the crabs and the cold waves. But I love music. I just love music thanks Ooh. oh i've missed one out <laughs> oh well uh what do we do so that's a poem about someone disappearing and that leads me uh to this poem which um is also about disappearance. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't generally do trigger warnings for my poems, but I will for this just because of the subject matter, not because of the language. Um, the way this poem came about was early this year, January this year, the start of the year. A friend of mine who's a, a photographer, an American photographer does a lot of work in Central America. And he was working in Mexico, in uh, Veracruz with uh, a local Mexican woman working with him. And in a case of mistaken identity that nobody can really explain, they got kidnapped by members of a drugs cartel. Um, several days later, they were released, but they're both still living with the physical and psychological trauma uh, that caused. This is a difficult poem on a difficult subject, but I sometimes think it's right and good and proper that poetry looks at difficult subjects. Um, in America, only in America, in Mexico, over 26,000 people have disappeared as a result of being kidnapped by the drugs cartels or the police or the state authorities. And in Spanish, they're called los desaparecidos, which means the disappeared. This is a, a poem called Desaparecida, which is one disappeared woman. And it also kind of, I suppose, Within it, there's an awareness of uh, being in a, of myself being in a really privileged position as someone living in a country where this doesn't happen. I did not know you. I did not know you and I was not there when Tuesday morning burst in upon you, kicked down the doors and stormed into the flat. When a dozen men with guns, policia, doing the work of the cartel, dragged you to the cars that waited, idling outside, dance tunes on the radio, drivers tapping their fingers, humming along. I did not know you, and I was not there, when they drove you to a nameless, faceless place built of breeze blocks, nightmares, fear of hours that stretch forever and the death of strangers. I was not there, and when they did to you what men with brutal minds and guns have always done to women, I still didn't know you. I still wasn't there. I did not know you, and I was not there when they set you free. When you stumbled back home, I was not there, and I do not know if you lent chairs against the broken door to close out the world and its guns and its hate. I do not know if you curled upon the bed and sobbed or stood under the shower for dripping hours hoping to wash away hurt and sin and shame. I was not there 
when you sat at the table and shook, when you smoked one trembling cigarette after another, when you cursed the God who lets these men, these malditos culeros, run free, when you prayed to Our Lady, to anyone who'd listen. I did not know you and I was not there, and they came back. When they came back and took you away again, when the car waited idling outside, driver tapping his fingers, humming along, when they wrote your name in sand and blood in the long, long list of desaparecidas. I did not know you and I was not there. And it's not enough. It'll never be enough. But I write this poem to keep alive your name, to light a candle of words, a small but steady flame that burns bright in the howling dark. And remembers you. Right, time I think then to finish with a couple of poems that are rather lighter and perhaps back, two of them back in my part of the world in the black country. Um, the black country as I mentioned is north and west of Birmingham. Birmingham, we're all part of the same sprawl if you come from outside. <laughs> And, um, but very different as far as we're concerned. And um, this is a poem that came about, I went into Birmingham for a friend's party. Um, I wanted to have a few drinks, so I took the train, uh, had a few drinks, and the party was going on till three or four in the morning, but I had to leave to get the last train back from Birmingham to Wolverhampton on a Saturday night. And uh, what an adventure is all I can say. Uh, full of people in spectacular states of disrepair for whatever reason. Um, as a poet, an absolute gold mine, because there was so much to see and hear. Um, great sights. So there was already a poem brewing and what absolutely clinched this poem there was one lad um, who was really struggling about what was going on around him. He was so drunk, his eyes were pointing in different directions. And uh, to reassure himself, he just asked a packed train carriage. Is this train gonna go to Wolverhampton? And quick as a flash, someone came back and went, no mate, it's going to go to Mars. So um, I got this poem out of it. It's called The Last Train Out of Birmingham on a Saturday night. This train is full of the drunk and the befuddled, the sozzled and bedraggled, the misplaced and the pure puddled, and it's rolling through the night. Late shift workers and young dancers, ravers, chemically enhanced, shady blaggers, shifty chancers who are higher than a kite. And someone asks, this train for Wolverhampton? The answer, no, it's bound for Mars, and I think, you should have had a pee at New Street. But hey, you can't knock a £2.40 return for space travel when it comes to value. These carriages are full of girls in glad rags and thick makeup, and a lad who just won't wake up, who two stops back, said he'd take up any offer of a fight. Drunk as lords and talking cod shit, wearing Guinness hats and tight fit stonewashed jeans or nylon sports kit, we travel at the speed of light. In the Birmingham area, that's about 50 or 60 miles an hour. And the woman from Ghana lays her head on her husband's shoulder and falls asleep, smiling. We fly past motorways and pylons, estates of sodium lights and sirens, canals of sticklebacks, and silence as deep and black as ink. And the lads are getting plastered as the drinking games get faster and two are nasty bastards and the thirds are missing link, but we are on the 2339 to outer space and we fear nothing. This carriage is a blur 
of fake tans and thigh-high hemlines, late-night burgers mixed with red wine, flirtatious banter and come-on signs, and the world of broken dreams is left behind, forgotten. We're drinking champagne from the bottle. It's a party at full throttle, but you know, nothing's what it seems. Because then, without warning, the train stops. Spits us out into the middle of, where on earth are we? And we're mumbling and stumbling and tottering and tumbling our confidence is crumbling we're blinking and we're lost the thin dry air of some new planet is this mars or just north and it's stuff it i can't stay here man it how much the taxi cost and we queue to go from here to a better place and in the conga line of come downs i see the woman from ghana and she's still smiling Right, two more poems for you, I think. This one is um, is the bonus poem in, in 31 Small Acts. I always have a bonus poem at the end as a little kind of either a treat or, oh God, another one, depending on how you've enjoyed the book. Um, this is, this poem, I was lucky enough to be asked to be part of a an arts project which was writing poems about a small black country town called Tipton which is about four miles from where I live but might as well be another world entirely and um, so we wrote a series of poems researched Tipton visited Tipton read about Tipton um, and this one came about um, as part of the research I discovered that in the 2011 census 15 people in Tipton put their religion as Jedi. So if you're a Star Wars fan, this might be one for you. Um, see how many references you pick up. Uh, what do I need to tell you? Tusca is a can of lager, a brand. A Staffy is a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. It's a dog. I think that covers it. At her terminal, in the library of a small forgotten planet, she wonders who the others are and how they made it here. When it closes, she walks to the stop, finds the 42 left a long, long time ago. Sees the young girl chattering on a mobile, hair up, princess sequined on her tea. The warrior monk striding to the bookies, firm hold on a can of Tusker and his staffy. And the delivery driver, who steers his truck through a hold-your-breath gap as the school-crossing lady parts afternoon traffic with her lightsaber lollipop, he's a heart-stopping whisker from disaster. Grins, drops his payload, motors on. When the bus comes, she boards for the far-off galaxy of West Brom and a date with a man who claims he'll take her places, has a pal who knows a Wookiee or two, gal. She stares through the bus window, passes the young lad as he downs another pint, tries to get his head around the news about his father. Cheers. Right, I'll leave you with one last poem, if that's all right. Um, thanks for listening i hope you've been enjoying this um i'm going to leave you with a poem about hope because hope is so always vital and probably never more vital than when you're living through the middle of a pandemic um this as with so many of my poems was um came about as a result of a real life incident which i describe in the first few lines um I hope you enjoy it. This is a poem called The Girl Next Door. Today, the girl next door knows that something good is going to happen. I can hear her singing through the bathroom wall. I just know that something good is going to happen. Today, she isn't tired. 
she isn't angry today bringing up a kid alone is something she can do she feels it sure and certain and pure and true because today something good is going to happen today the council will fix the sticking door the bills will come and she'll have money set aside and she can dream her boy will never be denied a job because there'll be jobs for all and he'll be proud and strong and have all those things she never got to own because today she knows something good is going to happen today under the gray skies her sun is shining hot and bright and carrying a tune and she is wonder woman she is super mom she's a vixen she's a vamp she's a heartbreaker who queues in the supermarket for reduced to clear, then dances home in the rain. Because today, something good is going to happen. Today, she'll buy a scratch card because she knows she's feeling lucky. She'll buy a packet of 10 and take five minutes out to spark one up and watch the world go by. She'll put on the old tunes from back in the day and smile to herself as she unlocks memories of lost nights, wild secrets, love that blazed. Because today, something good is going to happen. Today, none of the mistakes she's made will ever matter. She'll forgive herself, go out and make some more. Because she's starting out with a clean slate. She will survive. She will thrive. She feels alive in a way she feared that she'd forgotten. And all those obstacles in her way, they're nothing she can't overcome. Because today, hope is blooming inside her like flowers in a desert once the storm has gone. And she is singing. Because she knows for a cast iron, solid gold, copper bottom certainty that something good is going to happen today or tomorrow or sometime when she's all but given up believing. Something good, something undeniably, wonderfully good is going to happen. And I hear her singing through the bathroom wall and I think it already has girl it already has cheers thank you very much that was wonderful thank you so much um, Steve for sharing with us poems that were humorous serious hopeful poems on wars on politics on body image on people who are missing, people who are living, going on their daily lives, rituals, romances. Thank you so much for this. It was it was a great pleasure. And I believe that um, some people in the audience might want to give comments or ask any questions, just to let you know. Uh, please feel free to write your comments and questions in the chat box, and then you may be invited to uh, use the mic. So, um, any questions or any anything that you would like to tell the poet, ask the poet? We have a few comments. Great poem and reference to the immortal Kate Bush by June Palmer. And uh, Elham Saeed Sayam Dost, who is our Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, says that was truly wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Rima Jagatirmai says wonderful poems as always, Steve. Thank you. Right, so I will start with the first question. Uh, Steve. What is it that inspires you the most during the past few months, let's say the pandemic? Is there anything specific in the vibes of the current situation that you find as being inspirational? Um, mm, that's a good question. I've ended up writing, I mean, unsurprisingly, I'd imagine 
a lot of poets have some way or another got written poems that reference or respond to lockdown and the pandemic just because of the impact it's had on our lives um so i've written i've written quite a lot of those um i do uh, i write i mean i write in response to the world around me who doesn't um so whether it's a pandemic or something i've read in the paper or just a, a tiny thing that i've come across that then i explore to to find out more so the the poem about the missing lad in swansea it was purely kicked off by a missing poster and curiosity so i think anything can can inspire um and perhaps the the the, the trick or the skill is in there's writing poems for ourselves you know we'll all do poems where you write it and you just it's for you and the piece of paper and perhaps you learn more about yourself or you have the satisfaction of having written um and ex expressed yourself and then there's whether you can make something that engages with other people and i suppose that for me there's always that that hope that uh you, i'll write something that in some way people go yes i recognize that or they can connect with it or it makes them see something in a in a slightly changed light perhaps um so all of those all of those things are right, right. Mm -hmm. thank you steve the questions seem to be rolling in right now um june palmer asks where did you find out about the Queen Victoria incident? Um, I think probably just about everybody in the black country knows about this incident. <laughs> it's a it's a chip that we are allowed to keep on our shoulder about. Um, it's partly one of our few claims to fame because the, there isn't, you know, it's not a very famous, although it's quite an important area, it's not very famous. Um, and also it's the idea that the the great and the good relied on everything that was turned out here but really didn't want to have to look too closely at it <laughs> so i think we all know that story <laughs> and, and there's another question from hind alfalasi in your poem dream time what do the blackbird and the robin symbolize what does the stanza mean as a whole so you may need to retrieve the poem right now um the, I know the poem that the the blackbird and the robin. Well, they are you know they are a blackbird and a robin during lockdown. Um, I think I wouldn't be the only person who found that perhaps we ended up getting a little closer to nature or nature getting a little closer to us than my other case. Mm -hmm. um, and he's back now. We've got a blackbird who um, certainly while uh, he and his his uh, partner were bringing up the their broods was really really happy to come close and uh, on the basis that we were going to provide him with food that was much easier than having to hunt for it himself um so and the ro and a robin the same so they they are simply a blackbird and a robin but i think they perhaps symbolize that our connection we are we are whether we admit it to ourselves or not we are part of the web of nature the sort of interlinked with it and we we can't exist i don't believe healthily without it mm -hmm. so um and they bring a little bit of magic into your life doesn't matter how cynical you are if you're you know if you've got a blackbird eating food i don't know a foot away from you that's still a, a thing of beauty and wonder and awe so um yeah that's what they are i mean i can relate to that i like how you said we come closer to nature or nature comes closer to us because you really hear about these stories where people are a bit more aware of birds that are visiting them for example there's a hoopoe that visits mm. every morning in in the garden and it's just beautiful it feels like our pet mm. it's just you know it's just that we're kind of there's this connection with the hoopoe every morning 
we don't leave any food for it. It just uh, it feels free and helps itself with the with the worms or whatever in the garden. But I see what you mean. So it's like it's like nature coming to us in a way. I like the way you said it. It's just uh, I haven't read your poem about it yet. Within, but it might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> within within the poem as well to answer. Um, Hint's question further. It, it was about the way that actually, with lockdown here at least, it felt like the quite strict boundaries that we set around our lives in order to give them structure uh -huh. kind of dissolved and reformed in different ways, or we found new ways of giving our lives structure. And right. in some ways, maybe that meant finding, finding company and uh, companionship from animals rather than because we didn't have it from other people because we couldn't leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question, uh, a comment actually. The poems were wonderful, sir, especially the one about disappearance. This is a comment by Rashid al -Dahnan. Thank you, Rashid. Um, um, again, more comments, amazing poem. So um, the poem about disappearance, what is it, what is it about the mysterious or the, um, you know, the whole concept of disappearance that makes us want to write about it? Is it the urge to try to find answers to unanswered questions or is it just the beauty of the mysterious itself or the opposite? Yeah. There's no beauty in it, and you know this is a reaction to themes such as disappearance. Do you mean, do you mean the the poem about the lad who disappeared, or yes. the one that was set in Mexico? Yes. That one, I think it was just a curiosity uh -huh. that inspired it because seeing the posters, I was just like, okay, is this did this happen yesterday? Is it last year? Is it a, a week ago? And I. You know, the great thing about the internet, you can go online and find information about whatever you want. And right. I did a bit of research and because what happens when someone disappears like that, you'll have friends and family saying, well, he was this and he was that. And you get a sense of this person. And yet no one knew and still, as far as I'm aware, doesn't know what had happened to him. Uh -huh. He simply disappeared he was on cctv down near the waterfront go so what happened no one knows mm -hmm. and yet and so what happens then is you kind of you end up with a lot that's that's unmarked don't you there's no there's no closure there's no grave to go and mourn at there's nothing and they're just forgotten and i just thought but that was, you know, that was someone with hopes and dreams and ambitions, all of which would appear to have gone. I just kind of wanted to explore that a bit, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was that was my drive on that one. Were there any shifts in the way that you write poetry after the, let's call it the new normal? Ooh. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. If, I'm not necessarily aware of any. I'm not. Mm -hmm. There may be some. It, sometimes it it takes time to recognise any shifts. Um, I mean, I, I suppose just generally through my time writing as a poet, you try always to improve, to learn, to hone your craft, and I hope that I. I'm perhaps better at writing now than I would have been, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and that's from learning from, you know, other poets and reading and listening and watching as much as anything else. But um, no, I think that probably that one constant in my, a relative constant in my work is I've always found people fascinating. And I've always found hidden narratives or the, the kind of uh, viewpoints that generally get written out of normal received 
uh, world, I found them fascinating. I think there's there's so much to be learned from the voices that are normally silenced. Um, so I do. I find I find people fascinating, and they were fascinating before lockdown, and they're fascinating in lockdown, and fascinating since as well, for me. That's very well said. Yes, definitely. I mean, people are are stories. They're basically walking stories, breathing stories, and yeah. um, you do add life to their lives through poetry, as well. So um, another question I wanted to ask about the new normal and the new poetry here. Um, we've been hearing lately that uh, so many of the so-called pandemic poets are compared with the poets, the interwar poets or the poets, modernist poets basically of World War One, World War II. Do you feel this connection? Do you oftentimes, if, if you do reach out to read poetry, do you find yourself drawn towards the poems of the interwar poets, say like T.S. Eliot or uh, Ezra Pound and the likes? I, um, I think I, I find my, I'm going to rewind. I do feel that sometimes there's an old adage about five blind men approaching an elephant and they each grab a different part of the elephant one gets the tusk one gets the trunk one gets an ear another a leg another a tail and each of them insists that that is what the elephant is really like and they're all right and they're all wrong at the same time so i think poetry is often bigger than we allow our perception of it to be you know it's more than just the performance poetry than i do it's more than uh, say socially or politically engaged poetry that that I might write it can be whatever you want it to be I'm I'm my sole drive really when I write is to write as well as I can about something that I think I want to write about and hope that once I've written it if I think it's appropriate it's something that I can share with people and engage it uh, that, that you know engage with them that they will that you're sharing art uh -huh. And, um, but as for that, beyond comparing to anybody else, it, uh, it's not something I do because I'm writing to do as well, the best I can. And I love reading, you know, as I said before about um, sometimes an open mic poet at an event will, will do the best poem for me, the poem that touches me or which I think is startling in its use of imagery or language. Uh, it'll be the best poem of the night. And so I just love reading and hearing good poetry, poetry that touches me, that makes me go, wow. Um, and that can be, you know, from whatever era and by anybody, but it can as easily be by someone who's, who's just written something fresh in a workshop um, as against something that was written by someone 70 or 80 or 100 years ago. All right, that's lovely. And um, speaking of sharing poetry, do you find yourself ending up sharing everything that you wrote or are there some certain poems that you just keep to yourself? Um, I keep to myself the ones that I think aren't very good. Okay. <laughs> for starters. Um, yeah, I mean, there will be there will be poems that I just go that I know I get why I wrote them and I think they're valid poems, but I don't that you'd either have to set them so much in context or that they refer to such a specific event, which is like yesterday's newspapers is just, you know, gone and blown away that, um, that I wouldn't really share them. Mm -hmm. But I suppose generally because i'm a i'm a performance poet i under normal circumstances i would go out and do readings and gigs and it's about sharing and it's about connection mm -hmm. i guess that generally that colors my writing i write generally in order to have created something that whatever it's about 
will be done to engage and to stimulate and share and connect. Lovely. We have another question um, by Jan Palmer. So who do you feel inspired by in particular? Any one poet? Um, I am inspired by so much and so many people. Um, I think I might be butchering this quote, but um, there's a famous quote from Lenny Bruce, which just goes inspired by every waking moment, you know, that which I think he's right. Whether, whether it's a poet or the way the sunlight comes through the trees or the, you know, movement of a flight of birds, there's so much to be inspired by. Um, and when it comes to poetry, yeah, it can be, it can be something that someone's produced in a workshop. It can be, um, a, an open mic it can be so many of the poets that are out and about at the moment um i mean the first poet if i look back the first poets that connected with me because at school when i learned poetry like a lot of kids probably at school certainly here it was taught in a way that killed it for me yeah. Uh, it was it was old people who were talking about a time I wasn't around in a language I didn't really recognize all these and those and odd rhythms and the first ones that that changed that was um the Mersey poets Roger McGough Adrian Henry Brian Patton uh from Liverpool who uh they wrote irreverent lively comic funny moving honest verse that would use the kind of language and humor that i recognized that might be someone who i meet chatting to on the bus or whatever so it was everyday stuff that changed it and the first poet that that i ended up kind of i suppose for their range and breadth of work as well as that uh, connection of, of language was Adrian Mitchell, who for me was just absolutely wonderful for having been unafraid to tackle huge subjects and at the same time uh, writing beautifully about everyday tendernesses or uh, just small banalities of, of life and still sometimes i'll pick up a big anthology of his work and sit and and just dip into it and then be inspired mm -hmm. we have another question by pierre gardashia who is uh, joining us from france today pierre asks a question of reference i heard you use a lot of references from the pop culture in pop culture, Jabberwocky is not only the piece from Lewis Carroll, but it is at least the film from Terry Gilliam and the Vorpal Sword in AD&D. &D. So the question is, can a backstab blade insta-kill on a natural 20? Question full of cryptic references, AD&D, &D, Dungeon and Dragon. <laughs> By the way, Pierre is, um, is an escape game designer and a philosopher. No, right, okay. Um, well, thanks, Peter. You're right on picking up on references to popular culture. Yes, they are in there. Um, and you clearly know your Jabberwocky. Um, I'm suspecting your question refers very much to Dungeons and Dragons, and I haven't got a clue. <laughs> um, I hope I hope if you need it to, that then it can. Will that be helpful? I hope that answers your question, Pierre. I've got an okay. I'll settle for that. <laughs> All right. So um, before we close, is there anyone who would like to say something to Steve or ask him anything? It's been a wonderful evening, Steve, uh, slash afternoon, slash morning, depending on where everybody is right now. Uh, thank you so much for this generous reading of poems. And I want to ask you if there's a link to your book that you may want to share. Oh, yeah, there's a good with the audience. 
I tried finding it on Amazon, but I, I couldn't find the latest uh, collection there. Um, yeah, uh, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Amazon. Okay. <laughs> um, which comes down to work practice, but it's more that um, the costs of trying, because of the way that they do things, the costs of trying to, uh, you can get it on Amazon in the UK. Right. Well, okay. That you would find um, there are Kindle editions of the last three books. Okay. So there's no Kindle edition or e edition of the new one, of the new collection? Yeah. Uh, oh, I think oh. so. There is? there is okay. Um, I don't. In the UK, a... the UK Amazon, right? No, that one will be because it's digital. That's across the board. Okay. That should be on all their platforms. Uh huh. Um, all right. Because I'm not sure. Certainly, mm -hmm. the two previous ones there is purely because um, it, they were sold out. So the only way for people to get them was as a digital one. Right. It, it may be. Yeah, it may not be of the current one, but of maybe three previous books. I think that's that's right. If I was a good salesman, I'd know. And I'm Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question from Duran Zahim. Uh, when you get inspired to write a poem, do you just sit down and write it in one go or over a certain time period, sort of like a book? That's a good question, actually. That is a good question. Mm -hmm. um, it varies. It varies. Sometimes, um, whatever's been mulling on in the subconscious, and however long that's been going on, I can't say. But sometimes the actual, right, here's the first line, and writing the poem does come in just a, a rush. So, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you go, wow, it's, it's there. Set it aside, come back to it, see what it reads like once it's settled. But uh, largely... The form and structure's there. And then other times, you know, there's been poems where it starts, it starts and then you you end up taking a wrong turning and maybe you have to come back a little while later, days, weeks, and 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 find the bits that worked and I have to plan out then where am I going with it? How's this? going to happen so the one for example about the young lad disappearing in Swansea I started that well the week after coming back from the visit to Swansea and it didn't I couldn't I didn't get it right I couldn't get it to work and so I left it and I came back and looked at it a few times and it was only what maybe a couple of weeks ago that really I suddenly I was like ah yes i know playing around with it moving it around and, and finding something that worked as far as i was concerned so it's a good question duran and mm -hmm. yeah it come, they so, come in all sorts of shapes right so it's um it takes sometimes several revisitations to yeah for sure to the poem itself and even the poem itself sometimes starts speaking to us differently it's probably about the same thing but with time mm -hmm. You know, we see things differently and we would want to go back and either change or add to the experience that is expressed in the poem, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes as well, discover through trying to write a poem that actually uh -huh. you're trying to write more than one poem. Right. You're trying to put too much into one. And sometimes it's learning that, you know what, that bit, I might be really pleased with it, but it doesn't belong in this poem. And I just need to take that out and put it over there. And maybe uh -huh. that'll be something else. You know, so it's it's. That, I think the the skill of learning to edit, yes. perhaps and focus. Those are okay. the two things I'm most. I found most valuable learning experiences mm -hmm. or learning curves. Mm -hmm. well, we have another question from John Keane. Do you scribble your first drafts in a notebook or do you type them up directly? That's also a good question because with me, I mean, I still can't determine which is the best way. I find myself doing both sometimes. Yeah, I think I do both. I mean, it depends where I am. If I'm sitting in front of the laptop, then maybe uh -huh. I will. Right. Uh, I, I used to always do it in a notebook and I still, I still really like doing that because if you've ever seen my drafts in a notebook, 
there are arrows that go from here to there and as things get moved around and I find that really useful because sometimes you do oh that needs to go here and then a little bit like oh no it didn't actually it needs to go over there so there's a kind of it has a, it's like looking at a historical sequence if I've done it in a notebook whereas the great thing about doing it typing them up is you can copy and paste and cut and move but sometimes you might I might in doing that lose something that would actually have been really good but I've edited it out without being able to go oh look I'll put a line through this so yeah it depends and if I'm out and about and I haven't got anything to type them on they go definitely go in a notebook it's always neater and tidier though on the, on the laptop. I mean, with me, uh, when I write in my notebook, I find myself code cracking when I'm back. I mean, I can't even read my own writing and um, you know, I find myself spending more time deciphering than continuing the poem. But yeah. there is a pleasure in writing with the pen. There is, there is. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, I think more and more I end up doing it on a laptop for exactly that reason that, um, right my pen and my hands going what how does this work um so but the process of deciphering can sometimes in and of itself produce some interesting no, results yes right i agree i totally agree with that okay so i guess our time is up i mean time passes real quick when we're having fun so thank you so much steve and we look forward to more Poetry Evenings with you. Uh, we also have, for those of you who haven't been to any of our open mics, we have a regular open mics that are held once every two months. And uh, Steve, we hope to have you with us again in our next open mic, which will be uh, sometime early in December. Okay, wonderful. All right, so uh, until we meet again, and thank you once more for this beautiful, general, and inspiring evening. Thank you very much for having me along. I really enjoyed it and really appreciate the opportunity. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. And see you all again. So good night and good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.